Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release. Whether you've been joining us since 1971 or just now discovering us, welcome. We're currently in June of 1982. Let's discover some video games together. We last played Clowns and Balloons for the Atari home computer. Let's see what is next. But first, a message from Star Pilot Phillips. And Cosmo. TV game computer. It's the Star Philips Video Pack. Boring. Boring. Cosmo, this Philips Not really. Video Pack is so advanced, it's frightening. Phillips wants you to have fun. This is Conquest of the World for the Philips Video Pack. We've already seen this on the Magnavox Odyssey 2 in North America, so let's head over to Europe and see the pretty much the exact same game as it was in Europe. Let's take a look at the box. Depending on what region you are, it's going to be in a, a different language, you know, French, German, uh, Italian. But uh, you can see this is what the 40, 41st cartridge of the Philips Video Pack in Europe. We flip it over on the back and, oh, yeah. It has a lot to this game, including, look at the middle, there is a board with pieces that you play this on. This is more than just your normal video game. This is a board game slash video game. And if you think to yourself, this is an extremely large box, that's because inside is several pieces, a board, and you are doing part of the calculation of the game itself on your Philips video pack. The rest is gonna be handled on the board, moving your pieces around. The object of the game is control the world. Let's take a look at the other artwork we have for Conquest of the World. This is an example of the manual or the front of the manual, but I couldn't find any more scans either in the North America or for loose video pack. We have to use a reconstructed one rather than the actual manual. And then we also have examples of the box. The box. There's the advertising flyer you would have seen at the time. Director of Intelligence CIA. Board the Dictator's entry into the Odyssey 2 computer. The board, oh wait, this is the Odyssey 2 one. Well, we, we're here in Europe. It's the Philips Video Pack. This is another piece that you would have gotten in the box. This breaks down all the countries and their powers and the levels of all of them. So you need not just the game to play this, you need a lot more. And we also have the cartridge you're going to pop in, as usual, with the handle on top for Conquest of the World. If you've already seen the Magnavox Odyssey 2 version of this, it's pretty much the same one. Let's take a look at the manual so you can see what we're getting into. Conquest of the World is a significant departure from traditional game design. The components have been designed to provide you with very realistic model of the real world, both electronically and graphically simulate strategic and tactical confrontation between world powers. The game board is a true-to-life model of the relationships between countries of the real world in the early 80s, as it should be. And the figures that all the units are placed on and what powers and control you have is based on a formula made by Ray S. Klein. You can see here it's perceived power equals critical mass times population plus territory plus economic capability plus military capability times the strategic purpose plus national will. It's that simple. But that's how they're going to calculate who has the most power in what places during the game. And this is just like other war games, except it has a lot more freedom for you to play and battle things out. Conquest of the World is the first game of its kind. Be ready for many unusual features. Take the rules one step at a time. You'll find it to be a fascinating game of endless challenge, which once learned is not at all difficult to explain to others. <laughs> they say that. This manual is obviously not the real scan. As we scroll through this, it is several pages long, and that's they've condensed this. This is a lot shorter than the actual scanned manual. It is even longer than that. But the object of this, this game is to lead your homeland to world domination. Through negotiations, conquests, and alliances, each successful conquest and alliance will make you strengthen your country's power base. The country with the strongest power base at the end of the game is the winner. It's that simple. <laughs> that's right, yes, we use that cartridge as a weapon. All right, so this has three different modes depending on where you battle things out. You can play as submarines, planes, or tanks. So land, sea, and air. The way the game works is it's all pretty much played on the board itself, the, 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 the physical board and pieces for the board. And then whenever you get in contact with another different civilization and you need to do a battle, you do that on the computer. In a way, this is an homage back to the original Odyssey. I'm talking 1972 Odyssey. If you want to see that, we have played a simulation of the Odyssey 1 down in the links below. And this is the same thing. There's lots of other pieces and cards that come with the original Odyssey, so it's a kind of a cool throwback. 
Be sure, oh yeah, this is about how, how to do powered on. Insert the cartridge, powered on, and then use Spacebar because this is another one of the series of games that is a combination of board slash video game. Where we, the first one we played was Quest for the Rings, an exceptional game for the time, way ahead of its time. And you played as the Dungeon Master. So this is kind of the same thing where you're doing all the commands on the main screen of the, the video game. So the left hand is going to display a, fra a flag with digital readout of energy units and the player commanding the left control and the other one will be the right hand control. So if you're using the left control, this is the person that's going to be who's going to be playing as the left side and then who's going to be playing as the right side of the game. And the first thing they do is they send you through training, like making sure you can actually boot up to play the game. You push red for the red unit, you press S for submarine mode, and then you press S to confirm, and then you put in the energy units. Now, the energy units you're going to be able to determine by how you played on the board. How much you've taken over of the world determines how much power you have to use as resources into a battle. So if we're playing, again, this is a game we cannot showcase and play all the way on the live show. It would be very, very long. One game setting could be two hours or three. It's a very verbose version of Risk. And the, if you if you if you're actually playing the game, you, you'll go through turns taking different countries out. And whenever you do, you have so much more resources you can use for a battle. So if someone decides to attack you via submarine like this example, you can determine how much energy or how much power do I want to send in for my submarines to try to take someone out. So it's it's a very unique idea. And this exa example shows you how to control the submarine in the submarine mo mode only. And then besides the submarine mode, we also have plane mode. So if you get attacked via the air, and then we also have via the tank on land, any direction you want. So here's what's in the box. You have the master strategy game cartridge, the homeland marker, which are large colored pieces. You also have small colored pieces, which are magnets. You have six sets of conquest alliance markers, and then you have power base unit chips which this is how you're determining how much power you have. It is little tiny chips or pieces of it. And one game board. There are so many pieces inside this board that it's very rare to find a complete in box of this game. And especially if it's for the Philips video pack like this one. And then they also break down in this made up manual all the different places, what their power base units are. So whenever you take them out, how much you're gonna get from them as you play the game. And then here's the rules of the game. To play the full game, you start it up and you begin as one country. This can play up to six people. And as you make your turn, it's a turn-based game, t t uh, d uh, taking out other countries, getting your power uh, uh, to, to use for different battles. Then you battle out other people, but every battle is always going to be one-on-one. -on -one. It's going to be two people that can uh, shoot each other with planes or tanks and so forth. Yes, right. If Intellivision made if Intellivision made this, it'd be even more complicated, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, this isn't the largest manual we've seen, but it is up there as one of the largest manuals. Okay, so we're not going to go through the entire manual. We weren't even through halfway through that manual, but I'm going to show you an example of what it's like to see the game in action without the board. Sadly. All right, so let's pop in Conquest of the World, published by Philips, the beginning of June 1962 on the Philips Video Pack. Yes, so this is what you see most of the time in Europe on the Phyllis Video Pack. You just get your keyboard, push the space bar, and here you are. So if someone is on the board and you've decided to take out another country, you now begin the battle. Is the battle taking place on the sea, on the air, or on ground? And that'll determine what kind of battle you're going you're gonna, you're gonna to be playing as. So for this example, I'm going to show you what it looks like if we were to take someone out on sea. So what you do first is you say you want to pick the R button on your keyboard for the red unit and you want to give the red unit let's say 1000 points of power and this would be calculated whenever you're playing the board game after you do that you push s and then we want to do for blue so i have to do this with the keyboard you push b on the keyboard i'll give blue a thousand points of power as well and then when you're ready to start i think we push s and then start again oh enter that's right there. Now, after you've entered the information, it's now playing out a battle scenario. I'm playing as one player, so I'm on the left side. You can see me moving my red sub. Every time I move, I'm using power units and slowly dropping down. And I can use an attack, firing off some torpedoes you can see right there. The other player, if this is trying to take out another country or some other units, they would control. I'm going to plug in the second controller to our video pack. They would control as the second blue player on the right side. And there it is moving around. 
And the way they play this mode out, it's uh, the best way to describe it is combat for the Atari VCS. It, it's pretty simple because you're just moving around the screen. The controls are uh, uh, absolute controls, pretty simple to pick up and play. And the, the submarine idea is that you just are hidden for a little bit of the time under the water. So you can see you move over to the side. Yeah, blow them up. Oh, did I blow myself up? And then that scenario ends. However much power was used, you save that later. The power units that are left over, you have to calculate and write them down by hand. So you're probably going to have a, a memo pad, especially if you're playing with six people with the full version. And then if you want to play a different one that wasn't the sub version, then you would go uh, red and then say another thousand units like that. Or oh, I think we need to clear it away. Yeah, let's clear it away. We'll reset it. And let's go again. Let's try the tank mode out. So we'll do red, give them a thousand units again, and go tank. And then for blue, give them a thousand units and go tank. And go. And now we're in the tank mode. So now if you were fighting someone on land, this is what would appear on the screen. That's how you'd play it. <laughs> That's true. A VHS game, right? I'm not sure how it would compare. Well, at least the way it's controlled or looks like, it's it's possible it's close. So just like the other modes, the tank is using absolute controls. I'm moving down. There's no tank controls for the tank. And you make, you make your way around, fire some shots, and blow people up. Very reminiscent of combat. And yes, took him out. And so that battle is finished. Does it keep going? Yeah. So that battle is finished. It gives the reward to the red team. You get to keep a certain amount of points, and then you, you have to calculate these to continue the board game. And that's how the game's played out. It is a it is an extremely it's it's such a complicated title. It's it's definitely ahead of its time, and it has to have all the pieces to really be enjoyed. Not just the system itself and the joystick, but I'd say of all the games we could play on a home console, it's not up to the level of Quest for the Rings, but it is an excellent title. I'm going to go four stars for Conquest of the World. It is a treat if you had everything and you wanted to play an intense Conquest World style game. Oh, yes, all the buttons. Well, this I don't know if it uses all of them. It does use a lot because we have a full keyboard on the Phyllis video pack. All right, so that's Conquest of the World. Man, after playing that, everything just seems so simple. And <laughs> go back to simpler times. Let's press forward and see our next game. We're here on the Atari home computer, and this is Creepers. Creepers is an, a game we don't have any artwork or box for, just a few screenshots, so we're just going to have to pop in and play Creepers by L. Simonson and F. Svensson. The beginning of June, 1982. Silicon Valley Systems did this one. Okay, so now this game I'm going to go refer to the left side description. We've arrived at the island of Gant in an attempt to locate and recover the golden chalice of the kingdom of Corpus. Somewhere within the ancient maze-like temple of Kavinu lies the chalice. The player's party consists of the heir of the Corpus throne, Prince Juan VII, wielder of the silver sword, Sir Dinish the martial artist, Squire Cot, the holder of the teleporting ring, Scholar Dell, the beautiful female archer, Gala the Huntress, the great escape artist, Dyke the Thief, and the firewall casting wizard, Zig. All characters must move as a group, and each one has individual offense and defensive strength. Each character has a special skill. If that character is lost, the skill is lost as well to the party. For instance, the Huntress can fire arrows, the Thief can safely open chests, and the Scholar can use special items. You explore the dun dungeon and avoid creepers. The goal is to gather the four different gemstones and complete your quest. This game I could not find manual, paperwork, or artwork for. I do not know who wrote that description, but that's all we have about creepers. So, now that you understand a little of the backstory, let's play by starting with, I don't know, push number one. Okay, so, we are in the game, and now... The, the the this is a very difficult to describe because the characters they just talked about are all around us as a role playing game. So we have a party of what is that three six eight people. All eight people in your party have the ability to do powers like this. Oh, now they're not responding. The problem with Creepers is it does not use the Atari VCS joystick. There is a creeper over on the left that is just destroying us and shooting us. If I want to move myself around, you can see I can move the party all together through the tunnel. And I can get the stats of the party. But this was not programmed to use a joystick, 
So you have to know the cursor keys on the original Atari 800 uh, keyboard to be able to move around. Look how slow the movement is. Whenever you have control of the characters and know which direction you want to attack, like if I want to use my wizard and fire a fireball. Come on, go. Oh, is he already dead? Yeah, they already took him out. Once you have an enemy in your party or a friendly in your party dead, you can't use them anymore. But the navigation is very, very clunky. And the controls are very confusing. If I hit M, it's going to give me the stats for... Let's see. Oh, it froze. Oh, my gosh. I think it froze up on me. Oh, no. Let's try it again. Booting up creepers one more time. This is one that I could not get to play correctly. Possibly because of the lack of documentation out there about how to play the game. I understand the cursor keys move you around, but it's really slow and sometimes does not respond. We're lucky to get these games to be available at all, but sometimes you get fragments of them and not the complete game. All right, let's try again pushing number one. Good question. Uh, whenever I booted it up, it read it as a disc, but I don't know if it was basic or not. All right, so let's try again. Ready? Good. Make our party move up. Nice. All right, so there we go. Now, if we want to go to the right, you can see I can fire a fire bolt because my wizard's there. And then if I want to get stats, I can see what my merchant's offensive and defensive skills are. If I want to see what the prince and the center's stats are, I hit P on the keyboard. But as far as all the attack and defensive power, it's all keyboard command. So it's extremely confusing if you don't have the documentation. Because of that, and because I, I kind of enjoy that this game was trying to push a whole party of people that you play in a role-playing and moving them all together. This is the very first time we've see, seen this. It is very, very ambitious, but it falls so flat. If someone has the documentation and wants us to try Creepers again, let me know. In the meantime, I'm going to say it was a noble attempt, but uh, this one's a one and a half star. It is a bad title. Uh, wait, no. It is broken. It is a one star game. Uh, it, 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 it's just not able to execute at all. Oh, Legend of Grimrock. That one is a little bit better. Uh, Creepers I wasn't familiar with until this time. All right, so after the failure of Creepers, let's press forward and see our next game. We're next on the Commodore VIC-20, and this is Cribbage. You've all been screaming for more Cribbage. All we have for Cribbage is an advertisement flyer by Abacus Software with the other titles that they released. And all we're going to do for Cribbage is to show you, there it is, over on the left side. We are not going to play any games of Cribbage. It's a very simple affair. It is not one of the best games you could play on a home computer. I'm going to say for Cribbage, of all the games you could play at the time, it is a two-star game. It is a bad game. It is something that you could just breeze by. <laughs> that is true. All of them moving together as one is kind of Monty Python-ish. Oh, man. All right, so with that, let's press forward and see our next game. Here we go on the TRS-80. This is Cyborg. Cyborg is a title that we only have a cassette screenshot for and not a box. So for artwork, all we have is these screenshots. It is a top-down game. Let's pop in Cyborg and play. Published by Malamurks. The beginning of June, 1982. <laughs> yes, possibly. I don't know how much it is costs. Cyborg. Here we go. When you mention Monty Python, I just think of the uh, Ministry of uh, Obscure, uh, Funny Walks, and then just all walking together. All right, created by Bill Dunleavy and Douglas Freyer. Way to go, Bill and Douglas. So this game is another interesting game. If we want to get instructions, let's push I. We use the arrow keys to move around. The break key is to switch our scanners. Enter stops the sled. We're in control of a sled. We use the number keys to move around. And then increase speed is A and Q. This also uses joystick control. So we'll be using joystick. And then you have a space bar to activate your high energy shield. Now the mines in the game and the robots in the game are what you destroy. But this is one of the first games that you don't shoot anything. You turn on your shield, and while the shield's on, that's how you destroy it, everything else. So whenever your shields are up, sensors will be disabled until hitting a signal module. Collect all the modules to proceed to the next complex. So this a game is essentially a collective, like a top-down Pac-Man game, but on a completely different scale. All right, so we can play levels 1 through 4, or M, if you're a master of Cyber. Or, no, M is for the masters. This is the high score table. <laughs> the Grey Warrior is up on top. 
And then if we want to go back to the title screen, nice touch. And we want to go level one. So we'll start by pushing one, and we're in the alpha complex. Okay, so this is... I'm going to push one to get my speed going, and I'm using the joystick now to run over the mines. I am doing that. I put turn on my shield. This is what the shield looks like. And then I'm picking up all the different artifacts. There's one there. Pick up another one. Wait, you can't fit through there? Okay, we'll go through there. And then go down this side. There's another mine, so turn the shield on. And that's how you destroy everything. There's another. In there's an enemy that first showed up. Oh, he's not even falling for it. Come on, buddy. Oh, did my, oh, my shield just went down by the time he came over. <laughs> so we died. Our shields left us right on the, the end of... So if you look at the top right side of the screen, that's our shield account. So if I'm holding down the shield, it slowly goes down. But then when you let off the shield, it recharges itself back up. All right, so let's go... What is two? Three. Oh, man, look at that. Really fast. So when you have the speed on, that's all that really happens as far as uh, control. Nice. Go and pick some more up. I can't go down there. Okay. Oh, is it an invisible maze? What? There's places that you cannot go. <laughs> I'm very, very confused. I guess we'll go this way then. Pick up all the chips. And then the modules over on the left, it's telling us that we have three modules left. There's another mine there. Oh, man, now we're in, like in maze territory. Two modules left. There's another one there. So we got one left to find. Got to watch my shields. We can stay here and recharge our shields a little bit. This title is so ambitious for the TRS-80. Doing this kind of scroll, the top-down view, and it's a game that is not doing a shooter or um, a, a maze game like a, a, a Berserk. There we go. So we got all the modules, and now we go to the Delta Complex. Next level. Interesting. They are giving us what feels like... Oh, okay. I haven't turned the speed on yet. That's right. Now let's go two to turn the speed on. So it just feels really bizarre whenever you first boot the game up. You move the joystick around. You don't do. You don't go anywhere until you push the numbers to move your your sled where it needs to go. Let's see if we can go. Oh, invisible walls. That is that's really tricky. That's probably the biggest downside. Is uh, can we, why can't we go through? Why can't we go through some areas but not others? Yeah, they're, they're trying to make it, like, maze-ish. Oh, you had such a great idea, too. Why ruin it with that? Look at this. Yeah, you can't... Some walls you just don't work. So it turns into an invisible maze you have to uh, wander through. Other than that, though, it is a, a genuinely very good game. I would give it lower marks for that. But uh, you, you gotta admit, the TRS-80 doing this is, is so cool. <laughs> Santa in his sleigh, going to pick up modules in the Delta Quadrant. There we go. Let's try going around this side. No, this way? Okay. No, oh, it won't go up there. These are the ones that are the trickiest ones. Let's see, can we go down anytime soon? Anytime. Yeah, it repeats for way too long. It feels like I'm playing a very advanced version of Pac-Man, going around to pick up dots again. Or, I'm sorry, modules. But just done... Oh, can't go that way. Okay, let's get this one. Take care of the mine. Shield's looking pretty good. Looks like we got six modules left. And another one. Oh, that's the enemy. Go! So you have to figure out your way through the invisible maze. Uh-oh, what happened? Whoa, the flashing! What does that mean? I didn't get all the modules. Did we run out of... Sh what did we run out of? Oh, they got me. Now, it's showing the sled number of lives over on the top right side of the screen. Yeah, some of it's mirroring and it warps, wraps around, but in some parts it does not. So this is when it gets confusing. When you start the game up, look, I'm moving the joystick, but I, never, I don't go anywhere. So it's... It, it, it feels like you want to be able to control or move the sled around right off the bat, but you have to push the number to go for the for the speed you want to travel. All right, so here's our last life. Just keep the shield on when the enemy comes up. And then when you're ready to move, let's go fast. Three, go. That's the way to go. 
Look at that scroll on the TRS-80. So nice. Oh, and the mine got me. <laughs> contest completed. Oh, cool. So it's like a space age contest. Congratulations. You're now a master of cyborg. Does it accept? Oh, it is. Lowercase and caps. That's pretty impressive. So there you go. That's Cyborg for the TRS-80. I'm willing to call it still an above-average title. It's not pushing anything too much farther forward in the, the, the game world, but it's still pretty well. I would still give it... Oh, the sound effect. Yes, it would. It would get old. We've seen worse sound effects, and uh, we've also seen music starting to sprinkle in video games, so I'd, uh, I'd give it a pass because even the sound effects at the time, if they were really, really annoying, you'd either lower the volume or just turn it off. Yeah. Great times. Thanks for coming, Rob. All right, so after Cyborg, let's see what is next. Okay, let's go to the arcade and play Devilfish. This is an arcade game that I'd love to know exactly what region it came out in. This was published and created by Arctic Computing. And as far as I know, they've been releasing games in the UK, even though the company is Taiwanese. So it's possible this was only in the UK or it could have been in parts of Asia. Let's take a look at the artwork for Devilfish. I don't know how to describe what I'm seeing right now. This looks like a fever dream and someone was deciding to paint what they were dreaming. <laughs> it says big, bigger, biggest. And there's like a, a squid with a fish and an octopus with a tank. It, it, uh, it just, I don't know what's happening. It, it's, they do have examples akin to Donkey Kong with the circles of who, who's playing. Like, hey, that's the devil fish there. That's the brave sea dog and that's the flashing fish. Whatever that means. And they have examples of screenshots down at the bottom. Here's an example of the arcade cabinet, the cocktail version, and then a fabricated version of what you would have seen as, as Devilfish. There's the there's the arcade PCB with a control panel, and it looks like the controls are just a four-way joystick and one button to drop the bait. There's the arcade marquee you would have seen for Devilfish. Did anyone see this? Did anyone play Devilfish? Did anyone walk away from Devilfish because you were scared of the artwork? And there's an example of the screenshot. All right, so other versions. We have another one on Galaxian Hardware that's possibly a bootleg. Let's go to the United Kingdom to play Devilfish by Arctic Electronics in the beginning of June 1982. So the attract mode tells us how to play. Set the fish as bait. Oh, okay. Oh, and if you touch the enemies, you die and go to fish heaven. <laughs> That's true. Most of these, you, how many people only saw them on MAME? Well, we're seeing it here for the first time. There's our score table. Got to get the score. Yes. <laughs> I, I don't really want to keep the picture up. It's freaking me out, man. Is the octopus eating the dog? Is the, the dog kissing the octopus? I don't know. Is it a fish or an octopus? Who knows? All right, let's put some coins in. I'm raising the volume as high as I can. It's still a very quiet affair. All right, so I am the devil fish in the center. I have the ability to just drop bait to slow enemies down. If the enemies get stuck in between one of these places, come on, do another one, then I'm able to take them out. And when I take them out, then you take them to the house. Oh, I can't get to the house. Get out of the way. And then when you cash them into the house, you get your points and then you move on. So you only have a fish to slow them down. So if I drop the fish like here, it slows them down for just a sec. The small enemies go right through. The larger enemies, once they're caught in the middle, then you can take care of them. So in a way, it's almost like the gameplay of Hyunkyo Alien. <laughs> We're gonna mention that game a lot on the show. Or uh, I was just gonna say Hyunkyo Alien. The only thing though is I'm not digging the holes or creating the traps. They're already cre they're already created. And then once we get one, go ahead and knock him out and then go in the house. I'll take another. And then going to the house is reminiscent of what we've seen with turtles, but essentially we're playing another Pac-Man variant. And wait, I just noticed this. The center of the screen is drawing a picture the more of these we cash in. I still don't know what's what's going on. <laughs> Doesn't it feel like I'm describing a dream to you? So I'm this yellow fish and I'm going around uh, 
getting any of the octopus the octopi that are trapped but if they aren't trapped then they're gonna kill me and if I capture them I go to a house yeah it, it, it's th there must have been drugs still going on over in Asia I mean it's the, it's 1982 there had to have been right go 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 oh and if you move slowly through the smaller ones can still get you since you don't make the, your own traps, like in Hyunkyo Alien, this doesn't really have the the better gameplay. What is that? The wall closed in. Okay, another one showed up. <laughs> Only the good fishes go to heaven. It's those tiny ones. I want to lay the bait for them. What? Oh, they eat the bait. I see. Gotta get to the house. Go, go, go. Man, this one in Cheeky Mouse, there's a few other ones we've seen from Asia in the arcades. They are whacked out. Just crazy. <laughs> we didn't get a manual for this one, but um, most arcade games, you want to be able to just pick up and play the game. Or go to the control panel and play the game. And this, I don't think you'd be used to it. You'd have to figure out, wait a second, how do I get the fish? Oh, I see. They describe in the attract mode what to do, but then again, it's still confusing. Oh, nope. <laughs> so bear in mind, we played every arcade game so far, and of all the arcade games, we still haven't seen all the, the popular ones of the golden age of arcade games. There's still some more yet to come. This one is another title that's raking in on the Pac-Man craze, and it's not really doing uh, a, a noble attempt. We've seen much better ones out there. Gosh, see? <laughs> Turtle meets Hyunkyo Alien. That's a good way to describe it. But you can't build your own traps. They're just there. And you use them if you want to use them. And if you got the little fast guys that come after you, well, feed them a fish, bait them, and then when they get larger, than, yeah, there's another one, that, little one that just came out. Let's see if he eats that fish down here. He didn't. Well, we got to pick it up. Yeah, and it is revealing a picture in the middle. I don't know what happens when we reveal the picture, but if we were in an arcade that had all the arcade games we've seen thus far, I would walk right by this one. In one sense, you could say it's charming. The character's a little cute blob, and we know how cute blobs are going to be. They're going to be very popular later. Trust me. Gosh. <laughs> Or, yeah, maybe... I, I don't know. I love Lock and Chase. Lock and Chase is great. Turtles is the so-so maze-type maze, maze, maze type game. But, I mean, come on. Devilfish? Think of all the other games you could play. You got four quarters. What are you going to spend your four quarters on? I'm still not willing to say it's bad. I'd say this is like a perfectly average game for 1982. As far as all arcade games go... It does have con constant music playing in the background, which is a nice touch for arcade games. Come on, buddy, take the bait. And I think we can cash in more, yeah, more and more, and then go to the house to reveal more of the picture, which I don't know what what's... Why are we revealing the picture? What's our motivation here? Oh, yeah, Donkey Kong is where my quarters would go. Donkey Kong and Frogger, that's where everything would go. All right, so that is Devilfish in the arcade. I want to go back to the arcade and play some of the other games besides Devilfish. I still wouldn't give Devilfish the nod as being a bad title. I'm going to go ahead and say it is a average title for all the games you could play in the arcade as of right now. And what would you say for Devilfish? Is it just throwing you off with the picture and you just want to never see this game ever again? <laughs> yeah, it is strange, but it doesn't do anything to push the arcade uh, world. All right, so after Devilfish, let's press forward and see our next game. It's time to go to England and play Dungeon Adventure on the NASCOM. We have Dungeon Adventure in two flavors on the NASCOM and the BBC Micro. This is the third in the trilogy of the Level 9 slash Middle Earth series. So for this one, I have a, a fabricated box because I couldn't find the actual NASCOM box. But let's pop in and play Dungeon Adventure. The beginning of June 1982 by Level 9 Computing on the NASCOM. 
Now, for this one, just for fun, because we're going to play this game twice, I'm going to try to play this game and see how far we can get without looking at a walkthrough, and then when we see it on the BBC Micro, we'll do the walkthrough. Welcome to Dungeon Adventure from Level 9. Enter English phrases and collect treasure and return to civilization along the forest road to win. You are on a mud bank north of a wide river. A stone bridge spans the waters, reaching from the granite cliffs above to the flat lands of the far bank, and a path climbs up to it. I can see it now in my mind. There's a piece of driftwood here, a huge packing case, open at one end rests on the ground. What next? Get wood. I don't understand. What do you mean don't understand? Get wood. Get driftwood? What? What do you mean don't understand? There's a piece of driftwood here. Get it. A huge packing case. Get case. What? It doesn't understand. Get. We've never had a text parser to understand. Get. A huge packing case over the end rests on the ground. I don't know how to get them. Uh, Take case. Ah, oh, it's take. Okay, so take wood. Finally, what about inventory? Does INV work? Yeah, INV works for inventory. We got a piece of resinous driftwood, a big packing case, and what next? Can we look? Okay, so we got a path that climbs up to, can we go up? Go up. We're on a wide stone bridge which stretches north and south across the placid waters of a huge river. At the north end, the bridge enters a gaping stone mouth in the cliff. What next? Let's go north. We're in a gloomy cavern between rows of jagged pointed stalagmites. A fetid odor drifts from a wide round passage to the north. A faint light shines in. All right. We really need uh, Richard Attenborough to be reading this. It would really inc it really help the, the presentation. Okay, so what next? We want to go... It doesn't have a direction. I guess north, north again? No, north. We're in a smooth round south, north-south passage. A flickering light is visible to the north. What next? Go north again. We're in a junction in the round north-south passage, illuminated by a jet of flame from the floor. To the east is a treasure vault, completely filled with valuables of every kind. All right, so let's go east. You fall headlong into a pit. You manage to get yourself killed. Want to be resurrected? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Your ghost rushes along but fades rapidly. You are completely dead. What? So we didn't get resurrected? Your score is zero out of 600 points. Wow, you didn't get very far. Another game? Yes. And then it begins again. Welcome to Dungeon Adventure from level nine. Blah, 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 blah. All right, so there, a quick taste of Dungeon Adventure on the NASCOM. I'd still say for this trilogy of text adventure games, I'm going to go three stars. It is going to be re-released with graphics like most adventure games. We're seeing that as a trend. They start with all text and then later they get re-released and have a few pictures here and there. <laughs> oh, not yours? Yep. All right, so after Dungeon Adventure on the NASCOM, our very next game is Dungeon Adventure for the BBC Micro. This one we found a lot more information for, including the box. Yes, this is the first one you would have seen. And you notice that it has a sleeve inside that sleeve. That is the manual they're using as the front of the box. And then we flip it over the back, you can see all it has is the level nine computing. Another great program from level nine. Oh yeah. I almost can smell the 1980s on that box. And then we also have an alternate one. This is the later one. You can see it's on the BBC Model B, needing 32K. And in the back of that box has magical treasures abound in the cavern fortress of the defeated demon lord. Because if you saw the episode where we played the last version of the trilogy, we defeated the demon lord. Not really. We didn't get through the whole thing. But that's what you would have done and then played the third one in the trilogy. A sense of humor is essential in this massive pure text adventure with over 200 locations, 100 puzzles, and a lot of very weird creatures. And they even have reviews. Check it out. Computer and video games, CBM64 educational computing. <laughs> a dungeon adventure is to be recommended. It will tease and delight. We'll be the judge of that. And you can see the other games in the series. Colossal Adventure was the first one. Adventure Quest. And here we are with Dungeon Adventure. There's the cassette tape we'll be playing on our BBC Micro, and that's where it was inside the box. It even has loading problems. A great majority of people have no trouble in loading this program in their computers. However, if you have problems, this list may help, and they list five things out. And believe me, you had problems loading this on the cassette. And there's an example of a screenshot, and we also have the manual. So inside that sleeve, here it is, the manual of Dungeon Adventure. Jubilation reigns in Minas Tirith. Oh yeah, this is definitely Lord of the Rings. At sunset yesterday, the sun was besieged by a sea of orcs and more arriving every hour, and it seems the defenders were doomed, but at sunrise, the watch looked over an empty plain. The attackers had given up the assault when on the point of victory. 
Initially, the only reaction was stunned amazement. But gradually, a rumor began to spread, first whispered in quiet corners, lest the telling should make it untrue, but eventually shouted in every street, the demon lord is dead. Oh, yes. And this is confirmed by the Wizards Council. So if you enjoy Lord of the Rings, I mean, come on, the best place to play Lord of the Rings is in England. And here we go. There's the lore for the game. Dungeon Adventure is a full-scale adventure game with well over 200 individually described locations, 700 messages, about 100 objects, etc., etc. They're really giving an homage to Zork. Zork is the king of text adventure games right now, and so they're showing off how many messages and individually described locations they have. To play Dungeon Adventure, we load from cassette and tell the computer what to do. Does it say take? No, it does not. I wonder if this one doesn't understand take either. Dungeon Adventure is amazingly easy to play. You don't need to be able to find the cursor, keys, blindfold, or hammer spacebar for hours. <laughs> now they're making fun of action games. You don't have to push all those buttons. Here, you just have to type in text commands. Over on the left side, we have how to load and start and then instructions on how to play level nine adventures. Very similar to what we've seen in North America for adventure games where they explain what adventure games are, how to talk to the computer to get it to understand you because you really need to know that. And here's some example commands over here above my head. How do you score the game? This one is just like Colossal Cave Adventure. Go find some treasures, bring them back, get points. And then they have some hints for you. Very nice. You, you are entitled one free clue. And a SAE is enclosed. You can send any one question to level nine. If you get stuck, we'll try to reply to the next post. Don't use the clue up too soon. You may waste it on something that you'll work out yourself while the answer is in the post. <laughs> so you can have a problem. Send in your one clue and they'll answer one uh, clue at a time. That is awesome. Touche, level nine. And it says this is written in a language known as A code. To give you an idea of compaction possible, this is basic with equivalent of four bytes of code. A code is also faster than basic, they claim here. And then other products by level nine. Yeah. Too cool. All right, so other versions are different ways to load Dungeon Adventure. Let's go to England and play Dungeon Adventure at the beginning of June 1982 by Level 9 Computing. Are we ready? Now we're going to get somewhere. We got all the answers. Level 9 gave us more than hints. Welcome to Dungeon Adventure from Level 9. Enter, enter English phrases. So here we go. We have the stone bridge that spans the waters reaching from the granite cliffs above the flat lands of the far bank, and a path climbs up to it. There's a piece of driftwood here, a huge packing case open at one end, rests on the ground. Now, before I begin, because we're going to go through the walkthrough, this is another title that's a text adventure game in England that is so difficult. When we solve these puzzles, they're the kind of puzzles that you think, how in the world would anyone ever have figured that out? So if you did play this at the time, let me know how you figured this stuff out. Okay, here we go. So the first thing we want to do is pick case. Get the case, pick wood. Okay, we got those two down. And then now let's go up. We're on the wide stone bridge, stretching north-south across the placid waters of a huge river. At the north end, the bridge enters a gaping stone mouth in the cliff. What do we want to do next? Go south. We're on the east-west road south of the river. A gigantic orc's head is carved into the cliff north of the river, its tongue forming a bridge over the waters to you. A ruined tower stands on top of the cliff. Okay, let's go west. We're on the east-west road, south of the river, and north of a steep, treeless hill. I'll go west again. We're south of the river on the edge of a vast field of poppies, which stretches west as far as the eye can see. A, som a somnolent perfume hangs heavy on the breeze. A dry poppy seed pod lies nearby. Pick pod. Pick pod. All right, we got the pod. Let's go east. We're on the east-west road, south of the river. Let's go east again. And go back east again. Now we're back on the uh, river beside the north flat grassy plain. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, how would you understand and find all this? You'd be drawing a map in 1982. And this game is a large game. It's um, more massive than some of the ones we've seen in North America, specifically by online systems. They have uh, kind of an easier way. We, we, we played uh, Adventure in Serenia by online systems on the IBM PC. And we saw the map for it, and it was a large game with a few screens, but it was still kind of easy to understand. This game, though, is another one that you you got to have the map. It's ridiculous. All right, so this one is a flat grassy plain. A line of stepping stones leads to a small island in the water. A young girl with flowing locks sits on the island. Let's do... Oh, wait, we want to go north again. Ignore the girl. We're on a stepping stone leading north to an island. The young girl with flowing locks sits on the island. 
Examine pod. Some seeds are dislodged and fall with loud explosions. Okay, and then after that, we want to go north. You are deaf to the siren song. Oh, it was a siren. Who? We didn't know that. We weren't supposed to listen to her. She flees in panic, and you're on the southern end of a small island reached by stepping stones from the south. The far end of the island is occupied by a vicious-looking willow tree with six long rubbery branches. A silver mirror lies nearby. So there you go. We just solved a puzzle where you had to examine the pod, and when the, you examine the pod, there are seeds that fall and make explosions that chase away the girl, but, but you didn't know the girl was a siren. Uh, what, what ends up happening is you keep trying to move around and you're stuck in a loop until you do this or figure this part out. Just, just ridiculous. Okay, here we go. So get that mirror. Oh, sorry. Pick the mirror up. Pick mirror. All right, so after we got the mirror, now let's go south. Back where we came. South again. After the island and south again. Okay, and let's drop the pod. Some seeds are dislodged and fall with loud explosions. This sound scares the bird away. So a grotesque bloated yellow bird with big ears squats in the nest. How do you get that bird away? Well, you drop seeds on it, of course. All right, now let's go up. We're in a huge nest. A large jade egg is here. Get egg? Does that work? Oh, sorry, pick. Pick egg? Got it. Now, this is kind of reminiscent of King's Quest. We're going to be climbing a tree in King's Quest. I'm familiar with that one. And it's very interesting that now, in 1982, we're climbing trees and getting eggs. This isn't the first time, too. We've done this two other times in text adventure games. All right, so now let's go back down the tree. We're back there, completely dwarfed by a huge untidy nest. A dry poppy seed pod lies nearby. Nice touch. They're describing what we already did on the ground. Okay, so after that, let's go north. And east, and north, and now at the edge of a forest beneath a particularly large tree. You can just glimpse a large clearing to the north. Two evil giants are asleep in the clearing. Let's go up the tree. We're on a sturdy branch over the clearing. Two fierce giants are asleep below. A ripe berry is within reach. Get berry, or pick berry. No, we can't carry anymore. What's our inventory? We have... Oh my gosh, this is another game. I forgot, level 9 has a total amount of inventory. I think you can only carry 4. So after you have 4 things, you can't carry any more after that. So you have to think about resource management in a text adventure game. Now, I'm used to text adventure games or any adventure games where, you remember the characters would just continue to hold things and you don't know where they, it goes? We're now at a time where the adventure games are giving you a limit to the number of things you can carry. That is ridiculous. Okay, we'll stop here. I can't believe that. That the game is limiting us carrying certain objects. All right, so I'm still going to say of all the games you can play on a home computer, Dungeon Adventure is a three-star affair, a perfectly average game. And with that, let's press forward and see our next game. After this commercial break. Atari. And travel the new frontiers of knowledge, excitement, Ooh. and challenge. Discover About. Atari home computers. Yes, home computers. Learn with computers truly designed for the home. They go through all the facets of Atari. Yet simple enough for your child to use. Play incredible games like Star Raiders. The killer app. Master your finances. Uh, don't do that. Feel the excitement only Atari can bring you with the world's most popular home video games like Super Breakout. Ooh, home video games. And the colossal hit Pac-Man. <laughs> Does everyone cheer when you play Super Breakout like too? Tempest. And then the arcade world for games. Thrill of intergalactic action. Yes. <laughs> Enter the computer age of the speed. I need to start life. playing arcade games like that. Discover Atari. 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 Thank you, Atari. Welcome to the world of Atari on the Atari home computer. And this is Embargo. Oh my gosh, yes, I just saw the chat. Curtis, there's so many sneaky things. We're, we've already seen a few of them. There's going to be much more later on. <laughs> yeah, you don't wear tuxes and pearls when you play Atari? Maybe I should start doing that instead of this shirt. All right, this is Embargo, a title by Gabelli Software. Love Gabelli Software. Let's see what it's like starting with the box. This is the only 
shot that I can get of Gabelli software. This is by the Solitaire Group. Gabelli just published it. And this one is on cartridge that you can play with an example of the screenshot. We also have the manual, which is just what you see on the inside sleeve. Embargo. The citizens of Zorel 6 and during the Galactic Council's strict trade embargo suffer greatly. All foodstuffs, materials, trade goods, and fuel must pass the close scrutiny of the Aurelian Guards. Goods deemed net essential for galactic security are shipped. All of the items are swiftly dispersed at the Council's already overflowing warehouses. To enforce this trade action, a massive fleet's been assembled to encircle the planet, but none have dared to challenge this fearsome military might. Until now. You have six, a six, to have a successful mission, you must maneuver unnoticed through the vast armada of patrolling craft which continually circle the globe. Once below this barrier, then you quickly dive between warehouse and factory, head directly to the loading docks, connect your cargo, and bring it back to the main ship. And then again and again, you keep doing this until the game repeats ad, ad, ad nauseum. All right, so this explains on the display your current score. You'll have the number of craft, shuttle remaining, and cargo, and then your fuel. Remaining pieces of cargo must be loaded before advancing to the next level of the game. Each drop of the fuel gauge denotes a decrease of 16 fuel units. In order to refuel, you must connect with a fuel cell. Loading isn't necessary for refueling. There's various levels of play. We can push the, what is it, select button on our Atari home computer. And then... Attaching and loading any piece of cargo will gain you points as followed. Bonus points added to your score immediately upon attaching the cargo. And here it is. The food cargo, the building supplies, the fuel cell, the raw materials. So in a way, we haven't played a game that is us capturing and bringing back cargo. We've captured and bring back, uh, brought back players, or we had to rescue players from behind the lines and so forth. So this is one of the first times we're, we're doing a, a mission where we're not bringing back people. We're trying to rescue supplies. And then we also get additional points for the robot ships you destroy. So there we go. The option key, start key, break key, and reset key will all be used. And they even have a hint. You, you only receive four shuttlecraft in which to accomplish your task. Avoid all objects and buildings. You will crash if you touch them. We just have uh, different alternate versions for this one. Let's pop it in play. Embargo at the beginning of June 1982 by the Solitaire Group, Bill Hooper, published by Gabelli Software. Okay, here we go. Let's play some Embargo. Now, this one is um, a title that is pretty reminiscent for Atari games. Whenever I want to push Option, it's switching up. You can see the number at the top of the screen giving us those difficulties, but that's it. All it is is uh, nine different game modes, and all it is is increase the speed. Okay, so let's push start, and we are in. There's our UFO, nice touch. I'm in control of the blue small UFO. I can only fire right and left, and the idea is the cargo down below is needing to be attached to my UFO. Once I have it, I bring it up and deliver it. Oh. Deliver it into the UFO. Oh, no, there's another one. Quick, get it. Oh, he's too fast. Okay, so let's try this one. Pick him up. Go. Oh, if you smash it in these ships, that's it. You got to make your way down. Grab cargo. And it sticks automatically. Didn't have to push any buttons. Very nice touch. Animation is pretty cool at the top with the UFO. And I do have a fire button. I can use that to blow up the ships. Just like that. Very well made title for the Atari home computer. And you get the premise. This is the idea. It's collecting and getting the cargo before it gets passed to the to the right side. Grab it there. I love how well and how easily this sticks to the, to the to your UFO. We played games that it just feels a little slippery, but this one works really good. Grab it, stick it, and go. And then you have to get it right on to get it in the UFO. Yes! Can believe the level one? Now we're on to level two. UFO comes back, and I think everything starts speeding up. Yeah, we have planes speeding up. You can see multiple cargo. <laughs> <laughs> and I already went too fast. Oh, um, uh, you mean uh, Mystic Arc, right? Mystic Arc? That one had the tractor beam. I love the tractor beam with that. Was that Activision that did that one? 
or was it Apollo or another third party? I don't know. This is pretty satisfying, letting it stick to the ship. And I think that is... Yeah, that's the end. Game over. Back to level one. Really fun idea. Simple premise. Great game for a home computer. If I was going to be picky, I'd say because the shot only goes left and right, it feels a little limiting. Alright, let's crank this up. Can I reset? can't reset. I want to see what the max level looks like. Oh, yes. Activision was a beast. It was iMagic. That's right. iMagic, not Activision. All right. Let's see embargo on max level. Five, six, seven, eight. Here we go. That's how you go right there. Look at that. Wow. Whoa, and they even have a star at the top. Oh, yeah, that's that's pretty fun. I'll take that. Get away from me. Oh, and the star got me. Cosmic arc. That's it. Yes, it is kind of like that. I, I enjoy the tractor game a little bit more. The sticking to your ship is a nice touch. But remember that that was on the VCS, not the Atari home computer. This one should have the power. All right, so what do you think? Of all the games you could play on a home computer, how enjoyment, how much enjoyment can you get out of Embargo? I'd say of all the games we played up to this point, it, it's, it, it's, it's Gabelli software. It works really well, well uh, plays really well. And uh, it's not anything because the uh, monotony could get to you for a little bit, but I'd still say it's an above average title for all the games you could play on a home computer this far. I'll go three and a half stars for Embargo. Lots of fun. Oh, the star and rockets. Oh, nice. Nice references. Yeah, it might be. Oh, yeah, it's pretty hectic, but you can turn it down, change it around if you wanted to. Another great th thing about the time of these games is they put so many options into them. They say that before you play, you have... Uh, different game modes you can play as. They, they say that there's multiple games in one, but we would call them variations now. All right, it's time to put our video game playing on pause this evening. If you could go back to 1982, how would you rate any of these games on our five-star rating scale? Just bear in mind, we've seen them all. We've played them all. And so we have a really good idea of what actually is good or not good based on the time. That's it for today. And like I always say, if something could conceivably explode, it means it most likely will. Hey everybody, thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9pm Central, so join us and let us know if we missed any games along the way. This video would not be possible without LaunchBox, RetroArch, and MAME. Tell all your friends there's some crazy guy named Chronologically Gaming trying to play every single video game. We have links down below that'll send you to places like our Discord and Patreon, and one that says all the video games we've ever played. If you go there, it's a list of everything, and you can click right to the game you want to see. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We are Perpetually Retro, and we will catch you next time.